All right, so welcome to Building Production Ready Containers. My name is Ben Briard. I'm a product manager here at Red Hat. I focus in the container space, um, specifically Linux containers. Uh, and I do everything from the runtimes to System D to Atomic OS, now Red Hat Core OS, which we just announced at the summit. Um, and here with us today, we also have Mr. Scott McCarty. You want to introduce yourself? Scott McCarty. <laughs> yeah, hey, you can clap for Scott. This is good. Hey, He's this famous. is good. I know. Yeah. I like it. No, I, actually, it's embarrassing. But uh, no, same thing. Actually, I'm moving into a new role, to be very honest, working with Ben. So it's actually super exciting. This is our first time to kind of announce it and talk about it. And so like, yeah. there's a ton of work at Red Hat going forward with the CoreOS stuff. So we're like super excited. Yeah, awesome. But I've been at Red Hat for seven years <laughs> doing other container stuff. And, and now the next button doesn't work on yeah. the clicker. Um, all right. so. How many of you guys think it's super easy to build containers? Nobody. Three people. Four. So I would, I would say it's actually super easy to build a container, a container, right? But it's, it's a lot more than that, right? We, cha we change the model, right? There's, there's, a, there's a process around building containers, right? It's not just a command. If you're firing and forgetting from your laptop to production, you're missing some steps, right? And I think a lot of people get uh, stuck in the weeds. Um, I tried to change the letter to something PG-13. That's supposed to be a C. Um, anyway, uh, we like XKCD. But so what we wanted to explore today is talking more about the process around doing this, right? So you guys have confidence, right? When you take containers uh, you know, uh, from their life cycle, right? And, and going, going into production. Uh, so this is kind of what we're going to look at, um, some of the capabilities. Uh, Scott's going to take us through a lot of the problems and trade-offs, uh, into the image fundamentals, um, and then what some of the obstacles are and how, how we can overcome them. Uh, then we'll look at kind of some tips and tricks and just put this all together for you guys. So I'm gonna turn it over all right, sweet. So we've been doing this a long time. Oh, it doesn't work. Yeah. I oh, well. I'll do this. That's cool. No, no worries. Um, so I always tell people, and I, if any of you were at the Container Internals Lab, you heard me say this, there's like everything that you know now as an architect or a developer or, solution or, or a systems admin still matters. It's just you have, to, you have to add kind of four new primitives to your tool belt. You need to think about container images, container hosts, orchestration, and registry servers are kind of new things you got to worry about in the environment, right? Like these are new things you got to set up, and each of them has a huge deep rabbit hole that you can learn within them. We're mostly going to focus on the container images part in this talk because it's a huge part of building it. But even when you're building the images, it still does tie back to the other three things. So like, you have to think about how they're going to be able to run within an orchestrated environment, how you're going to be able to get data to them, how you're going to be able to, to embed passwords or not embed passwords, hopefully, if you're doing it right. Um, but like things like that. So like, you still need to take these other things into consideration as you move through the image build process. Um, we're also going to dig into the orchestration definitions, which, so if you think about it, like, it's really bringing kind of Legos to market, right? You've got to have an instruction set and then all the blocks. And so we kind of try to break it down, like, there's three main things you really need to think about when you're trying to build production-ready containers. You need to think about the images. You need to think about the orchestration definitions. So like in a Kubernetes or OpenShift world, this means the YAML, you know, typically that's going to help tie those container images together and define all the resources within Kubernetes. And then how are you going to deliver those things, right? Like, so not everything's a container image, although many things are. We were talking earlier, even, even probably OS updates at some point become containers. But, but there's also still that metadata, those YAML files that define the application. And you probably have to think about Git in addition to a registry server. So you got to think about the logistics. And then setting the mindset right. I ran into Ryan actually today, which was really cool. Nice. Uh, so like, so I just want to kind of share with you like, I thought this was brilliant. This is one of our engineers that worked on containerizing OpenStack, and so he worked on a really hard problem set where you have a. Uh, if you think about OpenStack, it's essentially a quintessential microservices app where it has so many different services that all work together. And we've been working for a couple years to put it into containers for production workloads so that it's easier to install and upgrade and things like that, all the benefits that you get from containers. Easier to deploy to the customer, easier to you know, provide updates to, easier to update the system itself, easier to orchestrate, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all about layers, right? Like it's basically DRY. It's similar to writing code in, the, in that you want to bury some of the functionality in functions. You want to share other functionality in libraries. 
and like those libraries may pull from other things, you know, and so if you look at like how libraries and code is built, it's very similar. It's all about layers and it's about putting the right amount in each layer and not putting too much, not too little and kind of balancing it. And so I kind of tie it together with like the application delivery is like this, right? Like at the end of the day, we want the app and the app is the, you know, it's the Lego toy, right? But to get to that Lego toy in different environments, you're going, whether it's on a developer's laptop or in a production data center or in a cloud, you're going to have to like have the definition, the images, and then, you know, basically a build process and logistics to get there. So I want to talk about kind of like, kind of one of the things that's important is, is the Open Containers Initiative. How many, raise your hand if you've heard about the Open Containers Initiative. Good, that's sweet. So Open Containers Initiative, I like to point out, is, is something as an architect, me, I care about because it's something that I know it can protect my investment, like time-wise, mentally, because I'm just tired and there's so much stuff to learn. And if I build images once, I want to know that I can use those images for a couple years and, and know that the tooling and all the learning that I did around learning that tooling and then all of the distribution logistics or the registry server and everything, I can trust that that's going to exist and I can use it if I want to push it into an Amazon registry that's not managed by me and then pull it out and use it. And so like, if you start to think about like interoperability between pieces of software and different store-bought solutions or, or, or cloud solutions. You, like, you need some kind of standard to help protect you, you know, when you're designing stuff. And so I, I first want to cover like what does it mean, right? Like so, so the, one of the questions we always get like in almost every talk is, is what's, the, wait, why, what's the difference between a VM and a container? So like I like to tell a story about, do you remember the VMware via like the virtual appliances? Like you would go to a web store and you would like scroll and it was like a bad 90s store. Like it was before Amazon got cool. And you would like go and download some virtual appliance, right? And it was terrible because you would download it. And yes, it was some kind of format that you could fire up inside of VMware. But as soon as you fired it up, you didn't know what to do with it. You're like, how do I change the password? Do I SSH into it? Do I connect to port 44082 or what? Like what do I do? I have no idea. So you'd have to go read some strange instructions. The beauty of like containers is you're embedding just the piece you need. So like the piece that moves fast is the application and then like say it's Python, the Python interpreter and whatever C libraries that Python interpreter is compiled against. So like say libssl or whatever. And you get just what you need. You package that in a format and, now, and you have a standard way to then fire that thing up. You have a way to run it. You know exactly how to shell into it. You know exactly what's going to fire up when you fire up that container. You know exactly what service is going to start inside of it. It's very defined and you also, can capture how to rebuild it, which if you ever downloaded a virtual appliance, like how do you update a virtual appliance? I have no idea, right? Like it was like, do you run a yum update in it? Is it Ubuntu? Is it, is it RHEL? Is it Windows? You don't know anything about it. In this scenario, you have a lot more control over what it is. And so I kind of walked through a little bit like what are the, what are some of the container like, you know, standards that you need to worry about like when you're thinking about production containers. Um, you know, we, we, the really exciting one is right in the middle. So the OCI, well, I'm sorry, the, to, the, to the left, the distribution specification, that one's very new. But now there's three. There's, so if you think, again, I mentioned there's a container image, a registry, and a host, right? So there's a standard that governs how to run it on a host. There's a standard that defines how to save it as an image. And there's also a standard now, the distribution spec, that defines how to move it around between registry servers, which is really nice because now, you're protected if you build OCI compliant images. So if you could push them to an Amazon registry, an Azure registry, a Red Hat provided registry, Quay.io, a competitor's registry, whatever you've bought, that's great. Um, and then and on the runtime side, I just kind of show here, CRI and CNI are kind of interesting standards that are in the Kubernetes world. We won't get deep into them. I go deeper into them in some other talks where we talk about the standards deeply, but the ones on the left are really the ones that we care about for this talk. Um, and then we kind of show the, I, again, I won't go deep into this, but I just kind of want to show um, using these standards, the beauty here is this is a tool chain that essentially removes the Docker engine. So this is, I, how many of you have heard of Cryo? Raise your hand if you've heard of Cryo. Sweet, that's actually a significant amount of people. So Cryo is CRI, Container Runtime Interface, which I pointed at back here, I showed you, um, and then dash O. So O for Open Containers Initiative. So, it's a, it's a connector between what Kubernetes expects from a container runtime or a container engine and then the, a container engine that can then go pull an open containers initiative image and then run it. So it's essentially tying everything I just said back together. Like it, and the beauty of Cryo is it's pegged to Kubernetes. It's, 
it runs like 350 more or plus more, I think, even tests. It can't, you can't make a change to cryo unless it passes all those tests, and it essentially passes all the smoke tests to then work within Kubernetes. It's pegged to the Kubernetes version, so when Kubernetes 110, 111, 112 come out, it's, it's always pegged to the version. Um, and then the beauty of it is that you kind of look at the top there, it, it complies with the CRI spec, so you can use tools like CRI, CTL to, enable, you know, to essentially interact with it. And then at a lower level, it relies on standard libraries that Red Hat's built that are open source, um, containers slash images and containers slash storage. And essentially, um, you know, I kind of show you where the standards apply, right? It pulls them with the distribution spec. It, it, it can pull anything that complies to the image spec. And then it uses run C at the lowest level. How many of you know what run C is? Okay, so I'll explain it. Run C is the imp reference implementation for how to run containers, and it's part of the OCI runtime spec. So it's distributed as code. It's a very terse little program that if you've ever tried to use it yourself, it's not super fun. Like I, of course, being a hacker, I had to mess around with it and try to get it to work and fire up a container, and it's, it's irritating to use, not gonna lie. But it's not meant to be for human interaction. It's mostly meant to be used and consumed within a container engine. But what it expects is a file system on the disk already exploded and some very terse like uh, JSON file that kind of tells it how to run stuff. If you pass it those two things, it will fire up a container in the right way. Um, and so like we built libraries that essentially make that easier to do. And then Podman is a tool that we built, Red Hat built uh, Dan Walsh's team and a, a lot of really cool engineers at Red Hat that kind of, um, that basically provides a command line interface that's very similar to Docker. So you can do podman run, podman rm, podman rmi. You can do a podman rmi dash all dash dash all, which is something that I've wanted for like four years. Um, so like it's really cool because it kind of provides you a lower level interface and it uses all the exact same libraries as cryo. So at, at some point the plan is that you'll be able to like troubleshoot and interact with all the same images that are on disk in the same running containers. So um, quick, quick note on podman. Yeah. Uh, this is actually going to land in RHEL as tech preview uh, with the 7.5.1, so uh, next week or the week after, I think, uh, that'll, that'll be coming out. So definitely, definitely check that out. It's, it's in you know, Fedora and other places now, uh, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's the tech preview. Yeah, and if you took the Container Internals Lab, or, or if you check it out, it's at learn.openshift.com. Um, you'll, there's, a, there's a section called subsystems, so if you like want to dig into this, we're actually going to be building a lot of tutorials around this and like showing how all this stuff works and kind of getting into the guts of it if you really want to understand it better. But the beauty, the takeaway of this slide is really that these standards protect you and now we were able to build tools that now run underneath Kubernetes very easily. Um, so, not going to go super, well, well I wanna at least the high, things I want to highlight around this is like, does everyone understand like when you do a Docker images, that's not actually showing you images. It's showing you repositories. It's showing you groups of image layers that are all together with different tags and different numbers and things like that. So the idea is that like every time you sync these things down, you're like kind of pulling down all the latest layers, but they're, we call them container images, but they're really not. So this, 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 this is really important because we assume things a lot of the time. We assume like latest means something temporally. We assume it means the latest thing that you're gonna get. But actually, as somebody pointed out, I think Jamie Duncan said it, latest can be oldest. Like you can point latest to the first image layer in the container and it just gives you the oldest thing in that repository. So like it's just by, it's, it's sort of an agreed upon standard that you should point it to the latest thing, but it's not enforced in any way. It's not like DNS. So this is important when you go to build your production ready containers, when you start to think about how you're gonna build your environment. Um, and then like, you know, just, I just kind of show here, highlight like, you know, they can live in a registry server, obviously they can live cached locally. So back to Ryan Hollis's point of build layers, these things can be cached locally. So don't think like the smallest base image is what you have to do or the smallest intermediate layers is what you have to do. They could be cached in production. Really what you want to think about is the smallest content size in all. So like we'll get deeper into this, but you'll see what I mean. Um, and here I want to dig into, I did this again earlier in the container internals lab, but I highlight it because it's so important. People don't understand like what these things mean and they can, they're, they're completely arbitrary is the word I was looking for. Um, like namespace, if you look at what, a, like, like if you pull a container image, I recommend you always use this full URL because the registry server obviously is DNS based and so we're very comfortable with that piece of it. The namespace means whatever the heck it means. Like on OpenShift, if you pull an image internally to OpenShift, it represents the namespace that it's in or the project that it's in. If you pull it from Docker Hub, it represents the username of the person that uploaded the image. If you pull it from the Red Hat registry, it represents the major product version 
So it'll be like rel 7. But this is arbitrary, right? Like there's no standard. And so like it's really easy to pull a container and run it. But then when you go to build your own stuff, you end up messing this up because you're like, oh, I didn't even think through it. I just like unintendedly used it as some purpose. And then some other team used some other purpose. And now it's really confusing because we all have this stuff in our registry server and all these different namespaces mean different things. They're not even like, they don't even represent the same thing. So just kind of want to highlight that. You want to think through these things. You want to think through what do you want the namespace, what do you want the repo to mean, what do you want the tags to mean. Typically, the tags mean versions. Typically, people tag them as versions. Typically, the repo represents some grouping of software. And typically, the namespace represents whatever people want it to represent. And then I also want to highlight that if you pull, you can actually use any one of these as the thing that you pull. And it is, it ha it is not deterministic. So like always use the full URL is the short thing, is the short takeaway here. So uh, another, another uh, XKCD slide for you guys. Um, we, we joke, right? Like uh, we want to automate everything, right? But um, you know, what happens when we, start to, when we start to automate everything? You know, we end up spending a lot of time on changing the automation. I always joke for a long, long time, I've been doing config management way too long. Um, you know, when you get into that, it's always about the input and output of things, right? Like, you've got to think about where the human input is. So if, like, once you automate stuff, you have to think about, all right, we don't have to document exactly what we did with the automation because people should be able to read the code, but we have to show them where the Git repo is and how to commit to the re Git repo and what is the process to get it reviewed to get things into the Git repo. And, like, you have to document that in those input outputs, right? And, like, how do we promote it? And, like, those things still need documented. So there's always documentation, even with automation. That's my rant on that slide. So I'm going to hand it over to Ben. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's good. All right. So name this harp, production ready container. So let's get into some of the, some of the rules. Uh, I think a lot of people are looking for what exactly do we do? I can't give you a, uh, an Ansible playbook or a, a Git repo or something that's perfect that will meet all of your organizational requirements, right? It doesn't exist. However, uh, what we can do is give you some pretty well-defined uh, rules along with some tools that you guys can take with you, right, to, to get where you need to go. Um, so this is a list we're going to drill down. All right. This is actually an old diagram. If you've been around Summit before, you've probably seen this before. Uh, but I think it's quite effective at showing uh, image layering and life cycle and how you can get the most from it. Um, standardization gives you guys a lot of things, and, and if you've been, you know, involved with any of the standard operating environment talks that we've done over the years, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty common theme uh, from a Red Hat perspective. But uh, one of the things I hear most frequently from customers is complaining about the size of the registries, right, that they grow, right, especially when you have a couple thousand developers uh, and they're churning and burning images a lot, right. Uh, if you can standardize on one Two, three, as, as, as few base images as possible. That is going to go a really, really long way once you get to scale and start throwing things up. It'll, it'll work for caching on your container hosts as well as uh, benefiting you on the back end. So same principles apply as you know the typical RHEL model, right, for a standard operating environment. So we do provide base images. Uh, you're welcome to use those. Uh, we would, in fact, encourage you to because that gives you that RHEL ABI, that standard uh, long life support in the user space for the container, right? Less change for your application. So as you keep updating them, it's less change uh, that can affect your affect your apps. Uh, so that's uh, that's that's the big benefit here uh, is you know, typical standardization. All right. So minimizing the storage. So we we give you two main tools to do this. Uh, one is we do we do have a rel image. Uh, it's you know. Uh, I think compressed, it's 70 megs on disk, it's, it's larger, it's under 200 megs. Um, if you're doing lots of middle layers, actually the rel image can save you space uh, depending on how your middle layers uh, actually are developed and, and maintained. Now, if you do need a purpose-built small container, we have one that's confusingly named the rel7 atomic image. This is a container image. Don't confuse it with atomic host. Uh, I know that name's my fault. Don't it's my fault, yeah, too. Yeah, I know. It's, we're <laughs> responsible. Uh, I'll, I'll own that. Uh, 
However, the, the, so the relative and atomic image is stripped out uh, everything except like glibc and just enough RPM to like add packages to it, right? So there is no Python, uh, there is no system D. These, these types of things that you, you may not need in a container base image. Uh, we actually rewrote um, parts of DNF in C. It's called micro DNF, uh, so you can still you know, pull packages and, and, and grab depths and, and so forth. Uh, but it's, it's really intuitive and easy to use. It's also well documented. Uh, okay, so that's one goal. If you guys have a use case for a container, maybe it needs to go to the edge or you have bandwidth constraints or you deploy a lot of them. Uh, if that's appealing, this image is super, super small. Now, another thing is obviously the big logo that looks like a Boston Terrier with underwear on his head, as Dan likes to say. Um, <laughs> it's, okay, it's, it's a hard hat, okay? It's not underwear. Um, with the ears uh, that pop through. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm distracting myself with bad jokes, sorry. Uh, so build a, this is a new tool for us, right? Uh, this is, uh, like Scott mentioned, we have Cryo, which is like the runtime uh, tool. Buildo is the other side, right, that builds container images. And what's, what's neat about this is you can keep the same workflow that you guys have always used, right? So beat it your Docker files, we'll build it, everything's fine. What's great about that model is you do have portability at the user space of the container. Um, if you don't need that, right, so if you're running RHEL as your build host, what's really cool about Build it is we can use those same tools on your host to actually populate your images, right? The other model means my image needs to have RPM, needs to have YAM, it needs to have all these other tools needed to build, build the container, right? Uh, with Build a, I can do YAM install into that root and I don't have to have a package manager in my container. So think about that for a second, right? When we're running in production, do you guys ever run yum update in your containers in production? Raise your hand if you do. Nobody took my bait. No, you don't do that. I'm right? going to talk to you uh, afterwards. Yeah, right. No, we're kidding. It's a safe place. You can, uh, <laughs> it's a promise. Uh, no, but so we don't do that, right? And, and the world we want to get to is where everything is read only in production, right? Like we don't even, we want to turn off the ephemeral stuff eventually. If, unfortunately, sometimes that has application, uh, you know, dependencies and stuff, and you have to account for that. That's really where we want to get to, though, is, is a read only world for production. Uh, and so if you don't need to do yum something, we, we don't actually need to carry it, right? And so we can do that if you call build a, um, you know, and use it the other way. But again, if you don't want to change the workflow, continue to use uh, your Docker files as you always had. Um, anyway, so that's, uh, that's one way to minimize. Oh, and the other point on minimize is since uh, the container, right, um, it's, your, it's your root file system, right? It's everything else. And it's, it's a, your container runs, it's, it's, isol it's process isolation at, at its root. Um, but you want to keep that sandbox small, right? If you put everything into that sandbox, it's not a sandbox, right? So that's kind of the, the point of why minimization matters. Apologize for forgetting that. Okay. Um, the other side is don't, you don't need to be the hero that does everything, right? Like don't be, I'm responsible for container images. Like think about your organization, the way you guys do things today. Typically we delegate these roles to different teams and different teams own the different parts of applications and deployments. Um, that model applies perfectly well uh, with, with containerization, right? Um, so if you guys have, you know, application teams that handle the app servers and so forth, well, you should look to build, um, you know, a co the app corresponding app server container, right, that that team owns and they own the life cycle of and everything else like that, right? Um, it's not appropriate for all models, but for large organizations, this seems to work really, really well. Is anybody doing anything like this today? Is anybody, I'm, I'm just curious, show of hands. Not a single one, wow, okay. Well, How many you of you are building images today? Yeah. Wow. Oh, so not that many people Pretty are building small. images, yeah. interesting. Okay. How well, many now are you like, all using them in really production? Cool take home. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I'm curious. <laughs> How many people are using containers in production? Okay, so that's why, not too many people. Okay. All right, so that makes sense. All right, good. Well, you guys are the place to start on the right track. This is, this is perfect. Yeah. Um, Okay, here's, here's the big one from my perspective, and, and this is a trap that we see people fall into, is the, the experience of getting started with containers, the barrier to entry is so low, it is so easy, it is so simple to fall into the trap of, I do it once, I deploy it, and forget about it, uh, because it's isolated, right? 
Um, and you can't do that. It's, containers are not fire and forget. All right? Everybody got that? It is not yeah. a fire and forget. You need process around it. Um, and, and that can go from testing to deployment, right? So from front to end. And then the other thing uh, is if security is not part of your automation, like you're never going to get where you want to go. Um, you have to bake in security into your process. So this can take the form of many things. Uh, just from scanning content, this is a normal, there's a broad ecosystem. Red Hat has tools uh, such as OpenSCAP that can look at the rel bits that we ship. Uh, now with Quay, we pick up uh, Clara, which is a really nice scanner that can scan content in the registry. There's plenty of third party in the ecosystem, but um, you, you need to have something that can do, uh, do the security requirements that your organization has. Um, and it needs to be part of your process, right? If you're reactive from security, that's, that's not where you need to be in, in this model, right? Uh, and if not, go read the Phoenix Project. It's hilarious what happens in there. Anybody who's read that, it's, it's great. All right. And being able to iterate. So if we do all of this stuff properly from the container images, making changes uh, is no longer a big deal. Like, you can absorb the change, right? If you have your testing as part of your container build pipeline, if you have your security changes, every time we do a, a change at the app tier and we pull it in and run it through our pipeline, if we've uh, finalized our deployment configs, then we go from known good to known good, right? Every single time. And that is the goal that we're after, is being able to absorb that change and deploy it competently. And just for kicks, this one's, I think this one's hilarious. This one's been modified too. Um, <laughs> All right, so we got plenty of time, which is nice. All right, so I've got two more slides for you that are gonna, I'm going to hurt you a little bit. We should take questions, right? Yeah, we'll yeah. take questions for sure. So pulling it all together, I wanted to at least kind of walk through like kind of what this looks like, right? So I, I, I brought back the Lego drawings, which I want to point out that I've, I originally made these in some online Lego diagram, and I saved them. And then they got deleted in the cloud. And I was very upset by this. And I'm never going to draw them again. So this is it. This is all there is. Um, you're only ever going to have that one instruction, this one robot, and that's it. But uh, so anyway, like, long story short is like, you kind of look at, like, how do I do this like, over life cycle, right? Um, at some point, some human being, like, especially riffing off the last one around iterate, right? Like a developer, and I, I use a developer loosely. I mean, anybody that built a container, could be an architect, could be a sysadmin, has to interact, right? They're gonna make changes to that blueprint, which is like that YAML file for Kubernetes. Maybe they'll change, oh, we gotta add a PVC because we actually added this other piece of software that needs a new volume, and now we added this caching layer, or whatever, you know, and like you're gonna kind of re-swizzle the, you know, the app. But there's changes you make to that, and you make changes to the images, right? And maybe you change the Docker file or use build a and decided to build it a different way, but like only one of the images because we're just testing it. So you're, they're going to have some, so I kind of show there, there's kind of a, does this thing have a laser pointer? Yes. Nice. So like you're kind of going to have an application life cycle here, right? And then at some point, this could be on your laptop, could be in a dev environment, could be on a sandbox, whatever. You're going to kind of get to somewhere where you like and you're going to go, that's what I want to produce, right? Like I want the whole thing together. Then you're going to ship the pieces out, right? You're going to ship the instructions, you're going to ship the container images out to something, right? Like, this is how you distribute it. And then at that point, you know, and again, this is kind of an example, but the same thing. Now some CI CD system is going to put this together and ship this, right? And then you may ship it first into, like, kind of a test gold cluster that looks like production. Maybe I'll build one copy just to kind of make sure that it works. And then if I like this, maybe I have a human interaction. Maybe I automatically do it if it passes tests, security tests, as Ben mentioned, everything. Maybe I ship it to here, you know. But it, at this level is where you want to capture all of that, right? Like there's going to be a process where you need to do some stuff, iterate, iterate, iterate quickly, and then maybe you ship it off once you kind of know it works to the CICD and then like really, really pass this on. But you kind of get like, you're going to have to test both things. And like you need to be able to distribute both things. It's more than just the registry server and some images and throwing it over the wall. Like, there's, a, there's more to it than that. And then I kind of, back to my point of, like, you got to kind of think about all the things. And so I kind of throw this together as kind of a, a representation. You want to model your app. You know, I'm going into the Lego diagram here. So this is kind of a breakdown of, like, the objects and resources that are in, in OpenShift. And so you want to think about it when it goes into production, right? Like, this is what it's going to look like. Um, 
uh, cutting out this piece actually because we're probably mostly going to be doing this stuff up here. We're going to think about like we may want a deployment config that tells it how many pods to go run of the container image and we may like define a, a, a persistent volume claim that then like gets you know satisfied um, at, you know at production by the production data right like there might be PCI data in the gold environment to like really test it out and maybe it's a mirror of, of production but like we don't want developers to ever have access to that PCI data, but we still want to be able to test, right? Like, and come back with some results that, oh, hey, that thing failed or whatever. Um, but I just kind of want to at least walk you through, like, here's the things that are happening in, like, the traditional IT world. These are still the, the living objects, right? There's a registry server hosts and, you know, images and, you know, load balancers, but then we kind of represent them in the Kubernetes YAML file, you know, that I, I mentioned. And so it's that plus the container images to kind of really get you into production. And so you got to kind of think about all that stuff, even when you're just building the images, so you kind of know how you're going to put it together. And I won't go deep into that, but I just kind of always want to like run through that. So cool. I think probably questions would be good. Yeah. Um, again, I, I think really if you guys follow this model as you start to grow in more container deployments in the, in the environment, this is, this is like this is a big deal, developing a process that makes sense for your organization, right, with the tools. And I'll tell you guys, uh, at Red Hat, we're in a situation where we ship publicly, we have over 400 container images that we, we do this on a regular case, right? These are supported products and technologies and piece, pieces of larger products, right? Anybody want to guess how, what tools we use to do this? Nobody wants to guess. OpenShift. <laughs> it's OpenShift is what we use uh, to build, keep everything fresh and ship it out to the registry. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think uh, it, it seems like you know from some of the questions, uh, maybe maybe you guys aren't doing a whole lot of this yet. So uh, happy to take questions if you guys want to dive into any of these points or talk about any of the tools in the space, uh, anything. Any, anybody have any questions? Yep, yeah, I, that's I'm, a good question. It, it is good. So I'll, I'll repeat it maybe just so. Oh yeah, understand. great question. Uh, so if we've got builds that are actually run on the host, how do we track if, if like developers are building on their hosts and, and if we move to production and other systems, what if we have problems doing that? I, I am not a fan of, I'm only a fan of building on your local system for just like smoke screen tests and stuff. I, I really think if you're, you need to be building in a central environment that is part of a, a pipeline. Either it's the output of a pipeline, right, where your container image becomes the artifact, or, or something in, in that type of model. I think you need to be building centrally. Now, uh, it's really common, I, I, would, I would suggest anybody on the builder, ho uh, builder path uh, to have a, a number of build hosts that are used, right? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a good model to, to break that, that kind of problem. So, so yes. So, and yes. I'll chime in a hair, because yeah. like, I'll admit, I'm, I'm always the, we kind of have different, I mean, okay. I agree with you. I think that's the easiest way to do it, let's say that. Um, I think there are times when the developer still wants to do it on their laptop. Um, and I think it's disconnected. I'm, I'm sympathetic to this because I come from a Python background at a at kind of a web company that was like very kind of like this, right? We'd want to do development on our laptops. But, but if you get into a containerized world, I'll argue, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to bite off a little bit more. You can't just let them go fire up Docker for Mac and like go start building images. Like it doesn't work like that. And here's why. So say I have a microservices application and say it has 10 different services in it. How am I going to operate on that one service I want to update and then test it? Like that's not really going to work, right? Like maybe, maybe I have smoke tests that I can just run for that one, but more likely it's something where I need to throw data at the entire system and see all the pieces interact. So again, kind of back to this, I would say you're going to want to have them have like an, a local environment that looks very much like production. Like even if it's a single all-in-one install of OpenShift, that still has like Kubernetes running obviously and can consume container images from production for all the other 11 services, not the one that they're operating on. They need to pull that down, change some code, rebuild that one, see how it interacts with the other 11, kind of run it themselves, then check that back in and then let it run through the CI CD pipeline in that central system. So like at the end of the day, like you can't, you can't really disconnect the two in my opinion. I'll admit I've seen only limited success with people doing that though. Like because it breaks people's brains to say I have to run a whole orchestration system on my laptop. But you're like, if you really want to test it with like a lot of complex services interacting, that's really the only, in my mind, the only sane way to do it. That's, that's a good question. Uh, not in the RHEL 7 timeframe. Uh, we, we, 
we did a lot of work on <laughs> getting down to that size. And it has to do with dependencies. Yeah, and if you guys see uh, Colin Walters, say thanks to him. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, we, it, to get it any smaller, we would have to break like foundational RPM dependencies, and we would actually have to make separate builds just for that, right? And so then you, you know, at that point, we're, we're, it's not rel anymore, right? So, uh, but that's, yeah, that's as small as you can get and do RPMs. Now, yeah, you can get, exactly. if you want to get smaller than that, Builder can get you there depending on which packages you're adding, right? If, you can really just do core utils, and it will come out smaller, right? Yep. Um, I would call it build from scratch. So everybody heard yeah. of scratch containers? Exactly. So like essentially, it, the way builder works is it creates like a mount, and then essentially it's like a change root almost. Like it, you know, if you've ever operated in a change root, and you like do it, it's almost like when you do a tar dash o or whatever it is, like where you like unzip it into a directory. Like you don't actually have the the zip utility in that directory, right? Like if you really think about the way Docker builds work, they're kind of they're really easy to get started, but it's not really the way you want to do it. You don't want to have all the tooling in the container that's building itself. Like, it's ridiculous. You kind of want that outside of it, and that's what Builder lets you do. So, for example, if you just have a C binary or a Go binary, you can literally just do a CP, copy that thing into the binary, and pff, it's a scratch container. And as long as you compile that C binary on that local rel host, you know it's compatible with that kernel, and it's going to be the same kernel that's in production, it's easy to just throw it in a container image and deliver it. So if you have something that's like 8 megabytes, no problem. Throw it in there. Make sure you compile it on a rel kernel, and make sure that you use the same glibc, and just make sure all that stuff's compatible. So I recommend doing it on the same kind of host as you're going to run in production. Um, because, you know, it's essentially the same thing as, like, R-syncing a binary from, like, I, I try to explain to people, like, it's not cool to, like, just copy a binary from Ubuntu under a rel system and run it. Like, would you ever, like, run the CP or the R-sync command? Like, like, would you feel good about synchronizing two terabytes of data with R-sync from a binary that you just copied off another Linux distribution? And you're like, yeah, that should kind of work, I mean, for the most part, right? Like, you want to probably compile it locally and then copy it into that container with build up, and then you have a really tiny container. Yeah, those are good questions. So the question was uh, going down the containerization path, not doing a whole lot today, but looking and categorizing applications and figuring out like, what, what the good candidates are and kind of how to get started. Is that, is that fair? OK. Um, so I. Yeah. Uh, OK. I don't, I don't think size itself should dictate what gets containerized. Um, yeah, if it's. You know, a terabyte, that would be really, really irritating. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, I, I, wouldn't, let, I wouldn't let size. Uh, it, I, I have seen containers, it, like two gigs for a container doesn't, doesn't make me nervous. It's not my favorite. I like them to be about 100 or whatever, right? Um, but but I, I wouldn't let, I don't focus so much on size. I focus more on, um, more on what the workload is, right, and, and what it does to the organization, and then the complexity, like your configuration, like how you make the container. There you go. Boom. Look at, what Scott, look at what Scott put up. So I always joke, a picture like, of that. code, configuration, and data are the three first things you've got to delve into. And like, for example, you said Apache. Perfect example. You know why? Because Apache has one binary, it has one config file, and it has one directory for data. It makes it super easy to put in a container. So, one port. Yeah, and one <laughs> port. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and, and you kind of go down here, and you kind of analyze each of these, you know, when you're looking at it. So, like, PeopleSoft, here's why it's not easy. <laughs> um, you know, put it in there, right? Like, I mean, restrictive proprietary, not even sure if I'm allowed to put it in a registry server. They might yell at me and say I'm not even allowed to do that. Um, no, the licensing is pretty easy on that, I hear. Is it? Oh, no, okay. it's not. Um, <laughs> you got me. <laughs> but, um, but you can kind of see, I love this one, though, the install.sh. Does everybody remember that bad boy? Like, you're like, just run it and see what happens. I don't know. Like, it changes whatever. And I actually had a customer, a telco, I won't name them. They actually got CA Network Spectrum Analyzer in a container. And the way they did it was they fired up a container manually, then they ran install.sh, they answered all the things, because it asked you like 40 questions, you know, whatever. And then you're like, yeah, yeah, no, put it here, do that, whatever. And then it just does whatever it does. And they sat back for an hour while it installed itself or whatever. You know, and it probably was like a gigabyte container after they were done. But then they exited out of the container, did a Docker commit. And again, you could do that in Builda, right? Like, you could just run the install.sh and see what happens. Like, if you can get it to install, great, and save that thing yeah, off. Maybe we should just make the point, though, if you're building containers, don't put an expect script in the container. Yeah, don't like, do don't, that. Don't, yeah. like, leave that yeah. out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, that, that was a good question. 
Thank you guys for being here. Uh, hope you enjoyed the summit. Thanks for coming.